Good morning, everyone, or I think actually we should say afternoon now, and you are here for another episode of the Resource Insider Podcast, and yet again, we are doing the quarantine edition, and even though I am officially out of quarantine after two weeks of being locked in my apartment, and I'm now able to essentially walk around the block, I can't really do anything else because Vancouver shut down, so we're going full speed ahead with the podcasts, and Today, uh, my guest on the show, many of you will recognize his name is Nolan Watson. And Nolan is the CEO and founder of a company called Sandstorm Gold. It is a royalty and streaming company based here in Vancouver. And today we're going to talk about gold. We're going to talk about how Nolan's managing Sandstorm through this crisis and just generally about what's going on in the world today. So without further ado, Nolan, thanks for taking some time out of your day and, and sitting down and chatting. Sounds good. Thanks, Jamie. So I happen to know uh, the Sandstorm office has been shut down for the time being, uh, given what's going on in the world. Where are you finding yourself holed up? So I'm holed up right now at my home in White Rock with my family in, in quarantine. I'm on day eight right now. All right. So worst places to be. Um, are you finding you guys are still able to get sort of business done as usual, that uh, a lot of work is getting done by conference calls and everything else, or have you found the mining industry to be sort of eerily quiet over the last few weeks? No, I would say we're, we're as busy as ever. One of the fortunate things that I find at Sandstorm is that our employees have very high emotional intelligence as their self-starters. When I look to hire employees, one of the things I'm looking for are people who are self-motivated. And so working from home with a team like Sandstorm has is actually a pretty easy thing and it's kind of funny when you actually take away the distractions of everything that happens in an office and the water cooler talk and all that type of stuff and you just sit by yourself and you work i found that our team is probably more productive <laughs> at times working this way and i'm on the phone about eight hours a day because everyone's calling me all the time well it's kind of interesting actually i found something similar to that too i found that there were a lot of things that i was doing uh meeting people and a lot of meeting people and going places that I thought added a lot of value to myself and to my business. And in hindsight, because I can't do that now, I realized I was mostly just wasting time. And I would actually say my productivity during this period has probably gone up by like 50%. I'm looking at more deals. I'm having more valuable interactions with people in shorter chunks. And I've cut like the dead weight, I suppose. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. I, uh, I'm enjoying it, actually. Have you ever, I know you've read the book, The Obstacle is the Way by Ryan Holiday, sort of a primer on stoicism. Have you ever read uh, one of his sequel books? And I think it's, I'm blanking on the name. It's like Stillness is the Strategy or Stillness is the Key. Stillness is the Key, I think is the, the uh, answer. I haven't. What's the premise? Well, it's, it's a lot like what I was just talking about. And it was very coincidental that I was reading it during this happening because it talks about all the great sort of leaders and warlords and politicians, et cetera, throughout history have kind of made this space around them where they're not constantly overcome by other people's opinions and day-to-day -day tasks and I guess minutia. And they kind of give themselves that mental space, that mental stillness to make longer term strategic decisions. And it was very timely to read it. I'd highly recommend uh, others check it out or finding themselves in this position, but you know, I, I kind of feel like the world is going through an enforced uh, stillness at the moment. No, it has. I actually found that's one of the things that I did miss. So I, for people who aren't familiar with me, so my house where my family lives is actually a really long drive from the office normally. And originally when I was told that I was going to be having to stay at home and work from home, I thought that's amazing. I don't have to do that drive. And it took, by day two, I was missing drive because that drive was when I thought my employees couldn't bother me. They couldn't pop into my office. My kids weren't in and out running around all the time. And it was just a still quiet place for me to think and strategize. And I missed it. So I've actually been driving every day. <laughs> <laughs> Are you just going like circles around the block? I'm in quarantine, so I'm not allowed to get out of my car. I literally yeah. go five minutes a day and just think and just be and strategize. And so I'm still doing that. So do you think that we're going to see the nature of how businesses are run 
change drastically after this. That's what I've been kind of wondering if there's going to be a lot of companies out there that think like, you know, shit, we're actually just as productive with 75% of our employees working from home and doing things remotely. And we can save X number of thousands or hundreds of thousands of dollars a year on office space. Do you think we'll see any of that? Or do you think people will be so desperate to rush back in and interact with humans again? Uh, I think we will see it on the margins. There are some businesses that are better suited for it than others, and some types of employee bases that are better suited for it than others. If you've got a high-performing, highly intelligent professionals who are self-motivated, they're well suited for that type of work. There are obviously a lot of people who are not self-motivated and would just absolutely take advantage of that. <laughs> <laughs> I think we all know those people in our lives, and so... Yeah. I think you will see more of it, but it'll be on long the edges. I don't see a drastic wholesale change in how the economy operates or how businesses operate, but I think maybe more flex work, work home days every now and then is something that people might, might play with. So you know there's a lot of Sandstorm employees hearing this right now that are going to take that no, as a key no. to never come back into the office again. I already know the four <laughs> people that are going to come back from this and be like, so Nolan, uh, you know, how about I get to work from home? I'm going to be like, well, so <laughs> How about no? We'll have a conversation about it. <laughs> so let's, let's talk about Sandstorm. Uh, Sandstorm is a royalty and streaming company. You've got over a billion dollar market cap. Um, you've seen you know, pretty intense volatility over the last uh, two to three weeks, like many other people. Can you kind of give us an overview of what's going on uh, with the stock, what's going on with the company internally, and, and how you're managing that in a pretty volatile time? Yeah, well, I would say just from a, I'll go through the trading and what's happening in the trading and then get into maybe the fundamentals of the business. The trading, same thing is happening with Sandstorm stock. It happened with every company around the world originally. There's this massive rush to liquidity and the value of basically everything in the world dropped for a period of time, a, a couple of weeks ago. And it was pretty spectacular to watch. Fortunately for Sandstorm, we're in a strong financial position. So we re-stepped into the market and started buying back our own shares at absolutely ridiculously cheap prices i mean it was kind of kind of fun actually buying those shares back so cheap and i feel bad because we're taking advantage of people who had low liquidity and probably had margin calls and had to sell but we're happy to buy back our shares at those low prices and we we think we're adding value to our shareholders when we do that so we'll continue to do that every time our share price keeps going down having said that what we've seen since then is that there has been sort of what you would expect in a situation like this, this rush to gold, gold prices are going up, and very quickly the value of a number of gold companies including Sandstorms started going back up again. And I think we're just, we're in that upward trajectory. I expect a year from now, a significant increase in the value of most precious metal companies in the world, definitely a significant increase in the royalty companies. And so Sandstorm share price I think is starting to go up again, and, and I think it's gonna be a lot higher a year from now. So when you guys got hit pretty badly, and I think you went from, you know, you're getting close to $11 a share and you hit a low of, I think, 450 at, at yeah. you know, the worst couple hours there. So I was buying up that stock. Uh, my guy got my dad to buy up that stock. We were sitting in a ski chalet in France at the time. And I was like, you, <laughs> you need to buy some of this. Uh, he'd seen, you know, his portfolio, you know, very general stock portfolio hit pretty hard like everybody else and was looking for ways to reposition. And so he came into that. Um, can you give us a primer on your view of why you think royalty companies are in a position to fare pretty well from this? Because, you know, you mentioned all, all companies, but why royalty companies in particular? Obviously, you've got a bias for that. You started a royalty company, you run a royalty company, but what about this business model gives it a, an edge, I guess? Yeah, so I've been saying this for years because I've been in the royalty space for a long time. And one of the key advantages of it is when you're operating a mine, if there's a fire or a flood or an earthquake or political unrest or coronavirus, and you have to shut the mine down, you still have an enormous amount of costs on a daily basis, and your revenue is now zero. Whereas at a royalty company, your costs are absolutely minuscule relative to your normal revenue. So if you have any of your royalties paying, you are a cash flow positive company. So mines are being shut down all around the world right now. And if you're an equity holder of that mining company, that mining company is losing tons and tons of money. If they mm -hmm. have debt, they're almost certainly violating their debt covenants. And the question starts becoming, will this company survive? 
I mean, will they survive at all? Is your equity going to go to zero? And in many cases, the answer will be no. But in some cases, the answer will be yes, that the company will come out of this crisis so financially uh, distraught that the mine will be sold off to someone else who has more, more cash. If you're an equity holder of a royalty company, you don't have to worry about any of those things. Uh, all the royalty companies are cash flow positive, even during this COVID-19 outbreak, and even with some of the, the mines that are when the royalties being shut down, all of us are still cash flow positive. And all of us are gonna have stronger balance sheets and more money coming out of this than when we went into it. And at the same time, what's happening is because we're cash flow positive, because we have strong balance sheets, because we have access to capital, food, data flows, or whatever, the royalty companies are now being looked to by the industry and Sandstorm included as a source of capital. So if you're a mining company and you need money today, you're phoning the royalty companies and saying, hey, can we sell you a royalty or can we sell you a stream? So not only is uh, a royalty company a safer investment, but this is the type of environment where we get opportunities to grow. So, so are you having people knock on your doors now and pretty uh, desperate to get some capital? Absolutely, yes. Now, can you tell us part, can you tell us the you next deal you're gonna do? Because <laughs> <laughs> your technical team sitting at home. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. We're, we're being asked daily. So on that note, you know, I read this morning that there was something on the order of 133 mines shut down. Uh, globally. I read that in a tweet. So everyone take that with a grain of salt because uh, <laughs> I don't know if it's actually true. But, you know, that begs the question, do you think we're going to see a lot more mines shut down? I mean, we've seen Peru shut down pretty much altogether. Do you think we're going to see that spread throughout, I mean, Latin America and potentially the world? Yeah, I think there will be more mines shut down, but it'll all be for a relatively short period of time. I mean, I expect all the mines to be up and running later this year the vast majority of them anyway. And so it will get worse before it gets better. But I think that from a, a mining company perspective, they're gonna have to get the mines started up eventually, or just the, the total financial devastation to the companies will be complete and absolute. And, and they're gonna have to get things going. So, you know, I, I kind of share the exact same view, but my, my theory on this, my working theory, is that because of that situation, we've probably seen a bottom in physical gold. I think like we're getting a supply crunch, you know, people are very scared right now. I think gold is only going to go up from here. However, I do think we're going to see in, and I don't know the timeline, maybe the coming days, maybe the coming months, a really, really excellent buying opportunity of, of equities in the space. I don't think we've seen a problem or rather, I don't think we've seen a bottom. I've argued with a lot of colleagues and brokers who are, kind of chasing stocks right now and trying to get in feeling like they missed that absolute crash uh, that happened a couple of weeks ago. I don't think we've seen the worst of it yet. I think the novelty of the stimulus package is going to wear off very soon when deaths in the US and throughout the world start to pick up. And I think people are going to panic. So does that, does that resonate with you or do you think uh, I'm way off on that? I don't think we've seen a bottom in the value of most companies around the world, including mining companies that are going to have to shut mm -hmm. down their mines. I do honestly believe we've seen the bottom in their price for all the royalty companies. And it's because people are, once the rush to liquidity is over and you can now start fundamentally valuing something based on what you think it's worth. And you realize that the royalty companies won't need to raise money if they don't want to. They are cash flow positive and all of the ounces that they were going to have uh, for cash flow, uh, producing cash flow are still there in the ground and they're still going to be produced. It's just going to be a few months delay. So I think the royalty companies have seen the bottom. So we've actually talked about, um, we talked about in this conversation, the idea of forced selling and market calls and how they impact the space. Would you be able to give us sort of a 30 second overview of what that actually is? Because I remember, I think a lot of people probably don't understand uh, how that works. And I know it's something that I didn't understand even a few years ago. And I think it would be very valuable for people to understand what that is and why it's so impactful. Yeah, there's really two basic different forms of forced selling that are happening right now. I'm, I'm oversimplifying it a bit, but the first form is when you have a normal person, what we would call a retail investor trading on margin. So they've borrowed money from their brokerage firm to invest and buy more equities than they had capital to do. So if you've got a person who puts $100,000 into their investment account, they invest that $100,000, then they go to their brokerage firm and say, hey, 
can you lend me more money? I want to buy more equity. And they will lend you that money, but against the value of your existing $100,000 of shares, which is all fine and good until the value of that $100,000 of shares goes down. So if they lend you another 50% margin, and so you've now invested 150,000, and the value of that original 100,000 and the new 50,000 starts shrinking as share prices go down, the broker firm looks, wakes up in the morning and says, hey, we let you money against the value of those shares. Those shares aren't worth as much anymore. We're only gonna lend you this smaller amount today and you don't have enough money to cover it. So they literally have automatic computer systems that will kick in in a lot of these brokerage accounts and they will literally just start indiscriminately selling some of the shares that that person has bought. So they could, they could be sleeping, you know, hit the snooze button on the alarm clock, wake up, log into their brokerage account and find that a bunch of those shares that they own had been sold by their brokerage firm without their permission. At any price, basically. Like at they're, they're selling 30% of the portfolio, gone. Yeah. Like, yeah. These are not limit orders. These are market orders and they'll sell it at whatever the price happens to be. And so people are losing money that way. But then there's, there's actually an even bigger effect that's happening right now, which is a lot of the institutional money managers around the world that invest in any type of company, if it's a gold fund, they invest in gold companies, like CFM has shareholders that are gold institutional investor or specialty funds. A lot of them have what you call an open-ended fund, which means you can put money into that fund if you want to, and it will, it will invest on your behalf. If people pull money out of those funds, they phone them up and say, hey, that money that I gave you last year, I want my $100,000 back. Or if it's, say for example, Saudi investment funds that say, I want my $300 million back and I want it back next week. Then those funds have to step in and just sell anything that's liquid, anything that moves to raise the cash for that redemption and, and when that person asks for that money back. And that's been happening en masse around the world in every industry. All right, well, thank you for that. Um, you know, before we say goodbye, could do you have any thoughts or advice on how you're managing your personal portfolio outside of Sandstorm? Uh, are you looking at this as a buying opportunity? Are you rushing to cash? Are you kind of waiting and seeing? What's your personal plan to, to manage this crisis? Yeah, coming into this, I think valuations were pretty lofty around the world. And so I was mostly cash in my investment portfolio. Um, I have already stepped into the market here about a week ago, buying things, and I plan on doing it in a couple of different phases. Phase one for me was when all of the wealthy companies were at the bottom, I bought a bunch of them. So yes, I was buying the shares of my competitors also. <laughs> about 60% of my net worth is in Sandstorm, so I think that's, that's enough for me right now. But um, I stepped in and I bought some of those, and I have watched those go up in value, and I think they're going to keep going up in value. I think what we're going to see is royalty companies and precious metals do this, and I think we're going to see base metal companies continue to go down. And so my plan is eventually just switch. I'll, I will buy some of the base metal companies that have been absolutely uh, crack, been crack kicked and I'll continue to hold 60% of my net worth in Sandstorm. It's my number one position. It's been my best performer over the years and that's my investment plan. So when you talk about our base metal companies, do you look at moving into the producing miners or do you look at development stage assets that have a good high quality established asset, cash in the bank? Are you, are you thinking purely producers? Purely producers. The producers are dramatically on sale right now. You're seeing uh, companies that yes, they have, they have some debt. And so there's some there. Yeah, companies like tech and companies like Glencore are down 70% from the peaks and still dropping. And I think you're going to see them continue to drop and you'll probably be able to get them on a fire sale. The thing is, when COVID-19 does eventually blow over, I don't know when that is, all of these mines are going to turn back on instantly. And I think you're going to see uh, commodity prices move back up. And so two years from now, they'll be making uh, very significant amounts of money. And I think they'll go close to the peaks, especially with the amount of quantitative easing that's being done by the Fed right now. You're going to see, see these dollar companies do well two, three, four, five years from now. Have you seen, uh, I think it was in the news just this morning, Bill Ackman is calling on Trump to sort of instigate uh, the biggest infrastructure stimulus program in the company's history. He's talking about, you know, basically rebuilding every bridge, tunnel, road, <laughs> et cetera, in America. Uh, yeah. I mean, do you think that's a, likely, a likelihood for these stimulus packages around the world to start pouring into infrastructure, be it in America, in China, where have you? 
Absolutely. And they'll be able to afford to do it because you're starting to see the central banks of those countries monetize their debt. So you see the, the U.S. federal government come in and say, we're going to go uh, put a $2 trillion stimulus package out there. And immediately the Fed comes out and says, we're going to buy U.S. government debt in unlimited quantities. And most people don't realize it, but uh, last week, I don't know if, if people remember years ago when they did QE2, and it took months and months and months and months of $80 billion a month of quantitative mm -hmm. easing to finish QE2. The Fed did the equivalent of QE2 last week. And so they're stepping in and they're, the U.S. government's issuing all this debt for massive stimulus and the Fed stepping in and then buying that debt. It's just sort of a Ponzi scheme, but I think we're going to see all the governments in the world do that. The Central Bank of Canada is talking about quantitative easing for the first time and uh, they're going to be stepping in and doing that. So we're going to see it all across the world. Do you have a view on the long-term effect on this? I mean, in the short term, it's, you know, it's great for the economy. It's great for gold prices. Like what, what happens in five years from now, 10 years ago, when you've completely decimated the value of currencies in almost every country around the world? The world's never been here before, candidly. The world is, this is a, an economic experiment. And I, I could pontificate, but I would be probably wrong. This is, we are in absolute uncharted territory economically. And I think it's going to be very entertaining to watch. Yeah. So, you know, leaving on that and understanding you got a lot to do today. Is there anything you think investors, listeners, anyone sitting at home should be thinking about in this time, whether from their portfolio or just in general? Well, I would just say from a personal perspective, take time to, I know this is a hard time to enjoy, and I don't want to be trite about the loss of human life that's happening right now, but if you're, you're locked up with loved ones, take time to enjoy them. You might not get this opportunity again for the rest of your life. And I would say financially, um, this is a time to be bold, but don't be so bold as to be stupid and start trading on margin. <laughs> Fair enough. All right, Nolan, thank you very much for taking a few minutes of your day today. Thank you. And for everyone sitting at home listening to this, if you're watching it on YouTube or any other platform, please like us or follow us and subscribe. It'd be a great help and it allows us to bring this to you and other people more easily. And on a final note, uh, I know a lot of our interviews, they cut out sometimes. Uh, from what I can tell, the internet and maybe Zoom is a bit overwhelmed here, but we're doing the best we can and we really appreciate your patience in listening through the, the odd audio clips. So. Thank you very much, guys, and appreciate everyone tuning in and listening to Nolan and I chat today. Thanks, Nolan.